I forget what the, how does this how does this function? You lean back, you awkwardly oh, place okay. your shoulders, <laughs> and you do this getting, weird like I'm getting stage fright. <laughs> I, some some people have stage fright. Some people are pee shy. You're clap shy. Yes. I decided. Uh, welcome yes. to episode number seventy four of the Carmudgeon Show. I'm Derek Tam Hyphen Scott, and I'm and an idiot, a professional one though. Yes, thank you. I'm paid to be an idiot. That means you can put it on your resume. The Carmudgeon Show is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. I got it. So I find that so yes. hard to say. And you want to say it? You um, tell them. You can tell them. Brought to you by mm-hmm. Reliable Carriers. Yes, the orange who, trucks. As you might imagine by the name, reliably carry vehicles in the United States and Canada. And can aid with international shipping? I don't know. Yes. Uh, you asked that question. Uh, yes. And if you want a quote from Reliable Carriers, because you have listened to us and you, need, you should get something in exchange for that other than the Hemorrhage, the hemorrhage the brain hemorrhage. Of, well, the hemorrhage of information that we're giving you here. Oh, yeah. yes. If that you com- mention, the, mention the Carmudgeon Show on your application, they will give you a 10% discount. For a quote. For a quote. Uh, so you should do that. You should also keep listening because this is a QA and a episode, as yes. witnessed by the fact that our computers are out. Yes, um, we will. Uh, like the last episode, there were so many cues that we did not have time to A them all. Uh, so... Sit back and relax. No, don't be. This is exciting. Sit on the edge of your seat and bite your nails. Everything. (laughs) Uh, Grab your fire extinguisher, fasten your seatbelt. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Moderately wild ride. Yeah, please return your seat backs to their upright and locked positions and your tray tables. Uh, Stow your stow. Stow your children under the seat in front of you. Wait. <laughs> no, it's dogs lately on the on planes. I've flown too much and everyone has a service animal. Uh, on that note, please cue please cue the Carmudgeon music so we can get this shit show started. <laughs> Got it. And I'm with you. <clears throat> right. Tonight. This morning, because it is eight o'clock on Monday morning. Is it? Oh, yeah, it is. For the for the people who are consuming, consuming this, this, you're like, oh my god, God, I. <laughs> you, I just took us from the end of the week to the beginning of yeah, the week. Do not time travel with me, please. I'm very confused. Because uh, it'll just be Monday morning at eight o'clock every time. Yeah, I don't, nobody needs that. Um, so as you guys know, it's going to be a Q and a episode, which means we have our laptops out and, oh, hold on. There we go. Now we can start out properly. See this high tech solution here. Yes. Everything's functioning. Um, which is amazing. I'm a little, how do you feel? I'm still coughing. Um, I've decided it's kennel cough. (laughs) (laughs) Have you slept lately? I, I sleep every night. Um, for entire here's, minutes here's the thing about this whole being sick thing i would be far more concerned if my boss didn't have exactly the same thing having gotten it two weeks before i did and he's still coughing and so his is now tapering off at like a you know seven week mark and i'm at the five week mark um you know what we're doing we're doing that thing that old people do when they just talk about their miscellaneous you know ailments. i i have spielches in my connected uh no um i'm it's good the cervicale acting up. Cervicale. Um, you know, we'll do a whole episode on Chevy. <laughs> I was here quite late <coughs> last night. Um, Sretin from M539 Restorations. I have his hoodie on, not his hoodie, I ho- hoodie okay. that he gave me. Yeah, no, no. Um, he was here in the Bay Area, and so we did a um, like a meet and greet kind of party. Haggerty bought uh, $700 worth of pizzas, and we consumed wow. them all. Mm-hmm. I guess it depends what brand of pizzas they are. Um, well, Domino's didn't answer the phone for an hour and a half. I would be on hold for five minutes and then they would pick up and hang up. And then after five minutes, the next time pick up and hang up. And so it must be like a five minute timer on the inside where like it starts to like, beep, 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 you got to answer this call and they just hang up on me. There's very high uh, demand yeah. for pizza. Who knew? At three o'clock on a Thursday, apparently. So anyway, so we went to a local place and uh, bought 14 pizzas. They were $40 mm-hmm. a piece because welcome to the Bay Area. Oh, thank you for having that reaction because I saw the receipt and I was like, since one is a pizza, 40 bucks. Turns out, uh, large, extra large pizza is 40 bucks. Anyway, we had a lot of fun. Um, wow. It's really f- funny to watch, you know, people who, who watch his channel. All he does is work on cars. Mm-hmm. Um, and so people are asking him questions like, my car's broken. Can you diagnose it? And, uh, you know, I kept like pointing to Bill Arnold, who's a local BMW repair legend. Um, and I'm like, we is there a professional in the house? And I was making fun of everyone. But Bill brought a part for us to install on the 
uh, on certain E46 M3 that he... Uh, That's his U.S. Around. road trip car. Yep. Look at that. He's doing the He's, same kind of nonsense that... That we did, yeah. That we have done. Um, but uh, he goes to start... We're in like we're in, in the Haggerty studio, right? So the lights are on and I have like the whole thing fogged up just for, for shits and giggles. And uh, he starts to install the part and like... The room went from like 120 decibels of like people talking to complete silence. I have a great picture of this. Everyone was dead, silent, videoing the master, putting in four 10 mil bolts. I mean, it was hilarious. Um, (laughs) um, But yes, he took off this morning with his girlfriend and all entourage, four of them in that car for uh, many thousands of miles. Convertible, so it's even smaller inside. Tiny backseat. But I mean, he had to swirl away like, squirrel away their luggage in like in the battery box under the spare tire well like in in the abs box in the engine that compartment car is front. definitely yeah. over its yeah. max gvwr yeah. Or, yeah. yeah weight rating. Rate yeah anyway so yeah it was a it's been a fun fun week uh he is not here on the podcast which i was hoping he'd be our second ever guest um but he is coming back and promises will join us next time because he's funny okay. all right splendid um and in the meantime um I have a Hyundai for sale. Oh, Mm -hmm. you loved it that much? Lightly used. Lightly used. (laughs) The parts of it that haven't been on the ground are lightly used. So here is the thing that I think is very important. I would otherwise put this car in Haggerty's new marketplace, which is Haggerty's um, (laughs) online auction. Uh, I'm not sure it would be accepted. Cars of the stars. Right. Here's the the problem with it. I don't want the maximum bid for that car. I want it to go to the right home. I would like to maximize my return on that investment. But so f- f- as by way of background, uh, yesterday, as we're recording this, so a couple two weeks, weeks ago, ago, two weeks ago, uh, uh, Icons, my Icons episode on the Genesis G90 launched. And that's Genesis's top of the line, so i.e. Hyundai's top of the line offering, latest offering. And I thought, <coughs> to put it in perspective, I should get the first ever car that Hyundai sold in America which was the 1986 XL could not find one anywhere. Um, so I, but I did man- manage to find a second gen XL, which is mechanically similar, um, basically a large facelift. And so I bought it and it was, I bought it from a, a from Copart, which was a, you know, it was a salvage auction. The car had been hit at l- what looks like 0.3 miles an hour on the front right corner, bent the frame. So I tied it to a tree, backed up repeatedly. And Oh yes, I oh. saw the footage of this. It looked like it was pretty productive. It Not worked. for the tree. It got no, the tree didn't seem to notice, but the car did uh, unbend the frame enough to get the door open reliably, open and closed. Uh, that was the idea. Um, and then, so I wrote wrote the script, and we did a very stupid stunt, which we can insert here. Um, and to do that, all I did was just take the entire front end apart and then put it all back together with no bolts. And so when I came to a screeching halt, the whole front end of the car fell off. But, and this is very important because I'm sure someone will be very upset at the at the apparent damage done to this car. I refused to allow any damage to happen to any part that hadn't already been damaged in the car's original accident. Because this is a 102,000 mile absolute time capsule of a Hyundai XL. And you know, there's one person or maybe no people in the world who are looking for a second gen Hyundai XL as a parts car or something to restore. And I just refused to break anything. So all the parts that I loosened were damaged in the accident, except for, for, the, for the door oh, glass. Yeah. Well, the door was damaged, but the glass shattered on the third or fourth take that we did of that screech. Is that to a the stop one screen. that That's made it in? In the outtakes. So the outtake, so that there are two, you get to see the scene twice yes. in the video. The first one is, I think, our probably second take, which was fine. The third take... When the door hit the ground, the window shattered, and the sound that that made was like this deep bellowing boom, and I just burst out laughing. Randy Popes, so the whole deal is Randy opens the door, and I don't have any, there's no bolts in the hinges, so the door just falls straight down, hits the ground, and falls over, and then we step over, and we don't even acknowledge, he gets out of the car, and he's, dang, Jason, an original Lexus LS400, not, neither one of us addressing, that's where the comedy comes from, the fact that the car has literally just fallen apart. Well, that it, we did, we did it a couple times. That time, the fucking noise was like I just started laughing. Right, so he gets out of the car and he goes, "Dang, Jason!" He steps right over the pile of broken glass that's still crackling because you know like when you break laminated glass, it crackles and and for hours. And I'm like, "That motherfucker's gonna stay in character. Like, how am I gonna do this?" 
put my best face on. I get out of the car and I walk over and he's delivering his lines and I see this enormous, I mean, it's amazing that one window can turn into that big of a pile of broken glass. And he's delivering his lines totally deadpan and I'm thinking, how the shit am I going to clean this up? Like we're on a racetrack. We've spilled glass everywhere. I don't have a, a broom. I, what? That's what's going through my head. And then it just, the funny bone gets hit and I just start giggling and I have to deliver a line and I just, well, if Randy's staying in character, I'm just going to deliver all of my lines. But I was so hysterical that all I sound like is like Minnie Mouse. <laughs> me, 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 me. It was, and the more, I, the more Randy stayed in character, the funnier I thought it was. And then finally he was like, and it didn't move. And he does this line where he just points at the thing and a wind gust comes in and blows all the champagne glasses off the... Well, that was the end of that. That was the absolute end of that. Meanwhile, I'm looking and I'm doing this, if you're watching the video, like at the pile of glass. I'm like, how the fuck are we going to clean this up? I mean, he's in character. The glass, the wine glasses fall over the place. It was so fun. Anyway, so I want the Hyundai to go to a... Uh, go All to that to say that the, the next owner of this car will experience something with tremendous provenance. Incredible provenance. It will be the most famous Hyundai XL second gen ever in the world. Um, it's a nice car. AC blows. First of all, somebody. This was somebody's baby. You have to reveal the real excitement, deflating characteristic of that car. That's no, an automatic. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's an automatic. But this was. It has LED headlight inserts, right? Somebody put LED he headlights in it. They there's an, a Viper alarm that that the alarm that you see in the video is the actual alarm going off. Um, it works. The air conditioning blows ice cold. The thing starts and runs perfectly. It drives absolutely perfect. This was someone's baby. And I hate that some like shopping cart hit it in a parking lot and totaled it. And as a owner of shit boxes for many years, it's really upsetting to when something has no monetary value, but huge value to you. It's really upsetting to watch other people destroy it. Oh, it's total. Go away. I want this to go. I'm really hoping this car goes to like someone who has been looking for a rust-free door for 20 years or wants a per genuinely perfect interior um i mean closest well we're doing our best to find yeah. that person so, at this yeah. very moment so dm me on instagram uh in the first words just you know hyundai excel or something so i see it because i get a lot of requests i really want this car it will go to the highest bidder but the bid is both monetary and the story tell me what you're doing with it because if somebody wants to preserve it or they need it as a part car you it's it's yours you outrank anyone who comes in with a higher bid yeah but why else um, would anyone bid higher for it? what would they intend to do with it if race car i mean someone will turn into a lemons car there's mm. a, you can rally it on back roads there's a million things you can do to further destroy it but it's too nice yes and everyone thought i was crazy until <clears throat> until like you know people here last night walked in we're looking at this car and like this is unbelievable this car is really really nice and i'm like i know i can't destroy it and it mm. smokes a little bit on you know when it's cold who doesn't <laughs> don't you smoke when you're hot <laughs> isn't that a line from uh like austin powers, austin powers. do you smoke Chuck after sex? sex i don't know baby i never looked um <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh, it's not uh, a good lines. i need to watch that movie again it's been 20 years we all should watch it again. i watched it after i remember being just absolutely uproarious when i first watched it and i watched it again recently and i was not as uproarious as i had remembered i think it's one of those movies that all of it's the really jokes fun to quote yeah, all of the jokes have made it into regular... Right, and so that uh, this is like the same issue that happens with cars, where they predict the future and then it becomes mainstream. And then you don't notice uh, them and anymore. you don't notice, yeah, then it doesn't have the same impact. Yeah. The one Look that, that really... We brought it back to cars somehow. Right. But the, the one that really holds up is Ace Ventura Pet Detective, the first one. I've I watched, watched that, that recently. You have? I have not. I, I, oh, I was like, vomit was coming up. I was laughing. I couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. And it, so that's another all righty then became, you know... Yes part of our vernacular but his physical jim carrey's physical yes. comedy the opening scene he's got a ups package that's you know that says uh uh fragile all over it and he's drop kicking it flipping it around and doing flips with it his physical comedy is so funny and i forgot about all of that mm. anyway enough of that let's talk about cars um since this let, is the Carmudgeon show we should go back to singing and we should have like our opening song be professionally recorded with that let's talk about cars baby let's, <laughs> let's talk, talk about, about you and me. me let's talk about all the cars and i don't know here we, we uh, thank you all for the questions by the way because holy shit y'all got a lot of fucking questions and they are yeah they are numerous and uh, fairly high quality yeah so we're doing a second one we hadn't planned on doing two uh, q a episodes but we got 
enough probably for three or four episodes, but we whittled them down to the ones that made the most sense. If there's, if we apologize, if you answered, asked a question that we didn't have an answer that we're not answering, it's because we either don't understand what the hell you're talking about because you were too yeah. fucked up when you wrote it. Yes, that's definitely a possibility. Or, or it's a someone else question. asked it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Right. So, uh, Eric Lee is asking about electric sports cars. In essence, how do we make uh, sports? How do we make an electric car fun? Yeah, I mean, I think the question here is, how do you make it so light that it remains fun? Because it's pretty obvious that you, you know, light cars are more fun, and I think you can't, not with the current stand of technology. Remembering that that always changes. Mm -hmm. You know, twenty five years from now, we may have super we capacitors. Have a, that, yeah, a battery revolution that could be incredibly light. Then maybe because yeah. if you had something that had the sort of hilarity of an ND chassis, mm -hmm. then you could be like, oh yeah, this is pretty fun for, for having. I mean, like electric race cars are kind of a thing. They Listen, don't have much. Tesla Roadster. It was it was a lot of fun, and it was what twenty eight hundred pounds, if I remember correctly. It's been year three thousand. Um, that was heavy is, for a Lotus Elise. Yes, but, but still objectively lighter than, for example, a new Porsche GT three. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so yeah, it, it, it could happen, but you'd really have to concentrate on weight. And I still think it would be an inferior experience because you wouldn't have like a, a, a truly wonderful internal combustion engine really steals the show and makes the experience. Yeah. I mean, I said in the, a line actually in that Genesis episode, which is that if an unbelievable engine or some sort of similar, some, what, what is that word in my head? I smell toast. Oh, <laughs> what? God. Um, Someone call the synonym. That is it. That is it. Some sort of synonym to a great engine can t turn a car from uh, from being great into a legend. And we use the LFA as a, an example. That car on its own would be great, but be, with on it that great car plus that engine, pfft, yeah, and it can render a you know a car that's great forgettable. So anyway, <laughs> next question uh, from Michael, and um, I'm based in Australia. Huge. Oh, he's based in Australia. Hi, Jason and and Derek. Hyphen. Um, one thing you both discussed briefly and mutually agree is the F5, F Ferrari F355s are terrible. I would love for this topic to be elaborated more. What makes them terrible and are there real positives? Hmm. You as the outspoken 355 hater can start. So let's start with the positives. I think it is perhaps one of the most beautiful cars ever made. It's certainly the most beautiful mid-engine Ferrari yeah. Uh, that with, you know, with the possible exception of their mega halo cars like the F40 or 288. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think they're wonderful to look at. Um, the character of the engine is fine. I enjoy it. It's naturally aspirated and high revving and you got to rev the piss out of it to get anything and there's some drama there. I'm not a fan of flat plane V8 noises and so the noise for me is, is unremarkable and not that enjoyable. I know everybody else disagrees. I'm genetically deficient. Um, no, but I think the reason people disagree is because they haven't been in one. In the car, so outside, that is some of the best noises to ever come out of any internal combustion engine. Okay. Inside, Prius, Prius four cylinder. It's not a it's not a pleasant note, and it's certainly not an exciting engine note. It's ah, yeah, and you're at eight thousand RPM. Outside, they're yeah. total night and day. But so. in in stock form, they're pretty quiet, even from outside. Way too quiet. Yeah, and so, you know, the I, the engine is not great. The gear change and and transaxle is fine. functional and fine, but not wonderful. The steering, I don't care for at all. The, there's a sensation in that car of um, some cars, like German cars, they feel like a a single piece. That you have removed everything that is not car, and to me, a three fifty five feels like a collection of parts attached to each other, like barely somewhat. Yeah, a funk nominally attached to each other, all sort of traveling down the road in the same general direction and speed. They just, they don't feel like high quality, confidence inspiring pieces of equipment from a, in a touch point sense. Nothing that you touch when you are driving it hard or just interacting with it generally it feels like a coherent whole that is stiff. It feels kind of floppy and cheap. And mm. that's before you get to the like interior plastics and the way that the leather all shrivels up and the stickies and the switch gear it all feels kind of cheap and chintzy and kind of garbagey and then you get to the point of like what does it look like when you own one and there's these service records where you're like this person spent forty thousand dollars on this car and then we took it for it you know this is an actual true story that happened to me you know someone has spent forty thousand dollars over the course of 10 years maintaining this 355 we take it in for an inspection they're like yeah it needs eleven thousand dollars of work even though it has like has to be the best maintained one around and it still has eleven thousand dollars of stuff that it needs trying to get them to smog properly mm -hmm. like check engine lights it's just this continuous stream of bullshit for <laughs> i'm getting heated um love this 
<laughs> are, you, contrib- are you smoking yet? Hey. <laughs> yes. And we're back. Because I'm getting heated. Uh, the, the, it's a contrib- continuous stream of bullshit for an experience that's not even that good. And so they're wonderful to look at. If you like the noise, that they're wonderful to listen to. And then like that's mm-hmm. kind of the end of the list aesthetic for, for in, like driving wise and like tactile interaction wise. I think and then there's all these people who delude themselves into thinking they're wonderful because it's beautiful. because it's a Ferrari and because it's beautiful and because maybe they don't have enough experience with other cars or because it is so emotionally engaging to them that they're willing to delude themselves into believing that they like the experience. Wow. That's a scathing review from Derek. Uh, you asked. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. You get what you asked for. They're not. Ter- they're not terrible. There's nothing not terrible bad. about the car, right? So he well, said you mutually agree that the F three fifty five is terrible. I would definitely would not go that far. I will say is not a great Ferrari. It's not a great sports car, and it's not a light your hair on fire experience the way the way the looks promise it to be, and the way it sounds from the outside. Yeah, it's I mean, fine. it's it's not. Yeah, it has a very it sets very high expectations and it doesn't live up to them. It is a perfectly functional device, but when it, that's not what a Ferrari, that's not what should, a Ferrari be. should be. You know, and here's the problem, maybe NSX has something to do with this, right? Because a, an NSX was a perfectly functional device and it was the exact opposite of what a supercar should be. So maybe NSX pushed Ferrari in the wrong direction. I don't know. It's, I at least get value out of driving an NSX fast because it doesn't feel like it's going to fly apart like 355s when i drive when i try to drive one swiftly it always feels like stuff's gonna fly off yeah i haven't i mean i've driven a couple hundred miles in one but it was mostly normal driving and it was fine but i never pushed one it was okay fair enough they're not terrible they're definitely positives but uh no not no, worth no. the hype no no i think that, there have been some questions about hype and that's a car to me that is hyped I'm okay reasonably you get this one because you get to pronounce his name piron flavius piron is that French? Is that a French, a French name? Yeah. Um, what's your opinion on Subaru Impreza GC8? Never driven one. I, he loves how light it feels for a all-wheel drive car. Um, yeah, they feel light because they have overboosted steering. They are fairly light because they're kind of chintzy. They're economy cars, basically. Um, I, they're fine. They're fine. Like like most Subarus, craptastic interior, but a nice, happy. It's, it's a happy car. Hmm. They like they're you know they're willing and yes, and there's some value yeah. to be gotten out of asking too much of them. Right, so uh, Landon Serco, what car will M539 restorations be driving when it gets to the Bay Area? That was an E46 M3 convertible. Um, that was not a question I was supposed to ask. If Jason had a child, would he get them the car he got his nephew in an Infiniti G35 coupe? Um, let me let me make this clear. My nephew's dream car was an Infiniti G35 coupe. He was able to get most of the way there to buying one, and by that I mean a half, two thirds of the way to buying one, but not didn't have enough saved up to actually buy it and maintain it and pay taxes on it so i helped him i i helped him with the rest of the purchase because i wanted him to have the car that he loved and that's really important if i had a child i would find out what the child loved and allow that child to go after his passion his or her passions and that's the most important thing i would never push my passions onto someone else i would give exactly the same answer if child is interested in cars, then like figure out a way to get there, yeah. you know, within reason. I mean, even not within reason, honestly. I mean, look, I worry that it was a 300 horsepower rear wheel drive car with, you know, with sketchy limit handling, rear active steering that wasn't tuned well. I'm not, per- I'm not a, a fan of that G35, but he is. And that was what's important. He, you know, he was not really into kid- cars when he was a kid and the sort of burgeoning car guy happened and it all revolved around VQ, you know, VQ chassis, uh, VQ engine n- n- Nissans, but mostly G35 coupe. And I thought, all right, it's a little bit too much power for an 18 year old. Um, it's a little bit too sketchy at the limit for an 18 year old, but this is his passion and this is what he wants. And by the way, when I rewind the clock to when I was 18, I wanted an E30 more than anything else. And my mom said, that's too much car for you and you can't have it. And you, you know, what if it breaks and what if it's this and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I wound up leasing a Corolla because it was reliable that I had to lemon law. Um, and I, I have a great relationship with my mother and we are friends and I adore her. But she fucked up by by not deferring to me as an 18 year old who knew far more about cars than she did. She knew more about life. And that was what she was thinking is like, what happens when this car breaks? You're not going to be able to afford to fix it. She was wrong. 
I got my fucking E30. I wound up getting a wagon, so I won. But the point was, it was a bad, it was a bad move on her part to dissuade me from the thing that I loved, and I would never want to do that. This is an interesting parenting <laughs> technique, generally. I think my my mom, especially because her, she grew up in a very draconian household, and so she wasn't allowed to do a lot of things that she wanted to do, and she rebelled very sort of acutely mm -hmm. as a result and so as a child she was like yeah unlimited candy and soda and then it just reached a point where we we're like i don't give a shit you know yeah it, this sort of like making something forbidden causes you to end up like jason about e30s right which is if immensely rabid right. uh and well i had already been that way yeah. and that was the thing is she she made it worse it was even more forbidden fruit and yes and there's something that well, draws you about them yeah, and then makes you fly to Germany and try to import an eleven-year-old car. One is, you know. yeah. Anyway, I, next. I love that story, which you can never tell. <laughs> yep. Uh, funny enough, uh, this um, this Landon person asked for a front-wheel drive episode, which went live already. Yes. Um, so that's but it. had not gone live when posing the question. Genius question, because um, who will make the most desirable, affordable s uh, the affordable sports SUV? Um, this is an interesting uh, question because. There are no sports SUVs. They're all kind of terrible. Uh, and they're mostly benign to drive, except for the car that the Landon found on his own, Mazda CX-50. Um, unbelievable. I mean, so it's is not, that not, the answer to the question? It's, the <laughs> Who question will make is, it? It sounds like someone is already doing it, the, and the, you answered your own question. Right. The question is, what, what do you want as a sports SUV? A Cayenne is amazing, right? It will do amazing things. Will it light your hair on fire in normal driving? No, but it's incredibly precise and sporty, whatever. But a uh, CX-50 is more fun. Um, and so uh, he also wants more screen time from that beautiful hunk, Derek. Okay. <laughs> is he turning red? Uh, I'm too dark to turn red, fortunately. <laughs> Moving on. Um, what are we asking about? Currently driving a Mazda 2. What is the best daily driver? Do everything dad car for $20,000 to replace my beloved super mini Mazda 2. So those space requirements of a Mazda 2 actually are not that great. So it sounds like a pretty petite car could work. I mean, wouldn't you just kick him upstairs to like a, a Mazda 3? No, uh, because he said once you get once you put a rear facing seat in the back, the front passenger becomes u useless. So he needs a little bit more space. Um, so what, CX-50? Did we just cover this? Uh, That's it, not 20,000. No, 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 but he wants lightweight. He wants, you know, 20. He's got a 2300 pound hatch right now. Uh, Veloster N. Mm. But does that have space? Is it requisite space? Civic Type R, Veloster, Civic Si even. Uh, Veloster's got a fairly decent back seat. Those aren't twenty thousand uh, dollars used. Mm, they're I mean, not really right now. Okay, every, inflation. Twenty k or less, you're going to have a really hard time to do everything well. But it, uh, the Veloster unless you get something kind of uh, old and sort of you know like a Mark Six GTI or something like that. Mark Six GTI I, Civic or an early SI Mark works. Seven, early Mark Seven mm -hmm. GTI Civic or Si like works. A Jetta wagon not yeah, fun enough all track manual yeah and but those are it. kind of spendy go but yeah to, just go to zero three four and put you know turbo and uh, stuff uh petty asks <clears throat> what's stopping other manufacturers from following porsche's business model of making na manual uh, na manual sport cars like the gt3 and gt4 idiocy short-sightedness inbreeding inbreeding mm -hmm. unconsciousness <laughs> drugs uh the gout <laughs> tertiary syphilis <laughs> uh lunacy uh, hallucinations hallucinogens twitter <laughs> right there are, so i mean you have recounted the story before about how hard andreas preuninger had to work to get those cars to exist mm -hmm. Uh, and how he had to go against the board of direct. I mean, there's so many different factors that stand in the way of realizing this. Uh, and you would hope that the success of Porsche and the resale values of these cars would inspire other manufacturers to be like, maybe we should do this. I mean, if I were BMW, I'd be looking very long and hard about this. But then in like general terms, there's a lot of trends about like sports cars are dying and like Miata sales aren't like that strong and blah, blah, blah. And so like how much actual appetite is there or demand is there? That having been said, if I were Ferrari, I mean, I think they could absolutely print huge piles of money if they were to put something that is, you know, let's call like a manual version of the 458 because mm -hmm. that's a, a great naturally aspirated car with a wonderful chassis that just if to bring something like that to market for Ferrari. Well, look at what the, look at the impact that the Z06 just had on the world car market. Everyone stopped, and, you know, an 8000 RPM flat plane, naturally aspirated V8. If that thing had a manual they would be they could easily sell them for three or four hundred thousand dollars a piece 
Um, so you're, you're right. They, they should all be paying attention to the GT car lineup at Porsche. But there's a lot of in or internal organizational just barriers that prevent that, whether it's the marketing people doing this or the people who are saying, like, we're doing market studies and showing that people aren't interested in that. Or, you know, the board of directors says that's too expensive and too risky to justify, you know, developing an entirely new powertrain with all of this testing that has to go with that for emissions and noise compliance. And like, though you get someone like Mark Royce at GM, who he just said, you're going to make a natural, you're going to make a Ferrari, a better Ferrari 458 and they make a Z06. The, here's the thing. The ultimate answer to this question is car companies are not in business to make cars. Car They're com- in business to make monies. Right. And the easy way to make money is to sell a lot of cars to a bunch of dumb people with turbos and automatics in them. And yeah, it's the ma- So the answer to your question is it's the masses. The masses right. are not that it's, it's, it's too much of a niche for most manufacturers to right. bother to serve that. Market. And don't forget that GT3 and GT4, all the, the Porsche GT cars are, are, are piggybacking on a car that's already been developed, right? So there's a huge budget, I'm sure, to do, to make a GT3 out of a 911, but the 911 is already done as a bespoke sports car, and no other manufacturers have bespoke sports cars anymore. I don't want to say none. Not very the few. Exotics, you know. Right, very few do. So how do you, I mean, Ferrari is the one that really yeah, is to me, so Ferrari, far up its own ass. Sorry to say it that way, but they have gone so far down this rabbit hole of we want full chassis integration with all of our computers. And for the for the computer to have full control over everything, it also has to have control over gear selection. Uh, mm, sorry, why are your old cars without with the ones with a manual selling with a hundred percent price premium or 200 percent price premium over this on the second hand market yeah. right clearly the the there is something to be said for the experience so while i understand chassis, that's why you chassis, buy a ferrari for the experience unfortunately you also have to have when you're making when you're ferrari you also have to have the fastest lap times and you have to have the fastest acceleration so they're stuck between but these Porsche two has worlds. navigated that by making would, variants of both yeah Turbo S and a GT3 and a GT3 RS and, and a GT2, RS, yeah. right? I mean, you know, so yeah, no, idiocy is, idiocy and finances are what are standing in the way of GT3s and GT4s. Okay, Matt. Matt Redeker asks, what are some of the things you believe automotive journalists are the most and least aligned on? And this one's highlighted green, which means we should do a whole episode on this. Um, Too long to answer here. Yeah, great question. Many thoughts. Too good of a question, so we're ignoring it and answering it at a later date. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, next, Adrian Tent. Hello, Jason, and hyphen. <laughs> um, so this person lives not in the United States, and uh, is very keen on a GT three fifty or GT three fifty R, and is wondering whether it's worth trying to import. Uh, so let's see. Where, where it doesn't say where in Europe. Generally, the import duties for new cars and like compliance, I think, very expensive. When, and potentially you know quite onerous uh but the question that he's asking is why might i not be happy with the decision to import one what are the some of the flaws okay it's physically huge it's physically it's a big bulky car and that works in texas yeah but Um, if you're doing a lot of b roads on cart tracks in england which they're famous for you might be hurtling families off into the they are low Pastures. to the ground. They scrape the front end scrapes a lot on stuff. You just have to be careful of its visual and and actual size and mass. And also remember that a Mustang is effectively a twenty six thousand dollar four cylinder rental car. So you can put an um, unbelievable powertrain and suspension on it, but the interior is still going to be crap. So I it's mean, less crap, but still crap. It's less crap. It's fine at it's at the car's base price, but when yes. you start factoring in import duty and shipping and all the rest of the stuff, this it's a big investment in a car that's not going to have an interior that lives up to that price. Yeah, I mean, it's an interior is quite a bit less nice than a Golf. Yeah. However, um, my my the 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 flaws are G, that GT three fifty Vudo motor explodes. They do have you know they have some issues with vibration tearing themselves apart um but the really other the only thing i don't love about that car is the gears are a little bit too long that is not an issue in most of europe i think that car would be fab it's perfectly geared for an autobahn um i think it's 58 mile an hour first gear 50 some you know it's quite long gears um and uh the early cars have great steering but uh don't uh, get it un- sideways yeah ever under boosted yeah, under the assist motor for the steering is too small. Uh, so when you get to full opposite lock in a, in a tank slap or drift, you physically can't move the wheel fast enough to catch it. Ask me how I know. Um, the later cars fix that uh, with a bigger power steering motor, but then has no steering feel. So 
Pick, choose your poison. Pick, choose your poison. Uh, but I would have a GT350 in Europe. That would be one hell of an experience. Hope you have a lot of money to pay for gas. Yes. <clears throat> Stefan. Uh, this one's for you. Oh. Would you consider the Z3 with a 2.8 M52 engine uh, a viable alternative to a Miata? It one, two, three. No. no. <laughs> Next question. No, you, you were going to say something intelligent. <laughs> no, no, I know, I know, I know. I'm just doing this for comedic effect. Uh, it really depends what kind of driver you are and what you're using the car for. If you're like a lot of Miata drivers are like old guys who are like, yeah, I'm going up for a Sunday drive and the roof's down. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Z3 would for sure do that. Sure. This is not the type of motoring that we use Miatas for. We use Miatas for primarily belly laughs. Yeah, I think. sideways stupidity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the the Z3 is just not a well-resolved enough chassis to provide that same level of entertainment. You do get that motor, but if I were to have that motor, I would rather have it in an E36. Yeah, absolutely. If I if I want looking for the experience, a weekend autocross car on a budget, it'd probably be an E36 sedan or coupe before it would be a Z3. Yeah, I mean, it's got no roof. It's floppy. It's also got that uh, the E30 multi-link suspension mm -hmm. instead of a uh, proper rear proper suspension. Proper four-link, yeah. Okay. Next up, Marius Rupp. Hi from Germany. This one's you. And thanks for the content. Great content. Uh, I want to sell the Z4. Get a more involving experience. Well, okay. Perfect, perfect follow-up question to the last yeah, one. So it sounds like the mm -hmm. answer to your question, uh, Stephen, is... Uh, <laughs> Talk to Marius. <laughs> yeah, talk to Marius about the experience of uh, the involvement level of a Z4. Yeah, so he wants a fun... Uh, a he wants Miata a Miata fun, fun, but more exciting engine. With a more exciting engine. Um, I mean, he's got he's got an E85 3 liter Z4. I... <sighs> Porsche. For 30K, I don't know price-wise. Uh, like a, nine, a 986 97. Boxster. 987. 97. Yeah, you could get a 987. But then it's... Uh, it's not a quite as fun and involving. It's a little too buttoned down. It's a little too... But he has Autobahns. So those things are great. High, really high speed stuff. The problem that uh, Miata works perfectly at US speeds. Miata is maxed out at 100 miles an hour at the top down. And that's not fast on an Autobahn. So... Mm. Is there some other vintage car that could potentially answer that question? There are I mean, 30 like, vintage cars. <laughs> yeah, like okay. a... I mean, just, we talk, just talked about E36, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but if you want something newer, it would be, for me, a Porsche. Um, okay. Joseph Earl, given an infinite level of automotive ma masochism, AKA if you were 20 again. So that's what, like a high tolerance for bullshit. High tolerance for bullshit. Okay. What car would you be, would be your, it will always get me there car. Aren't those things opposed? Because if you're really masochistic, you should be driving a car that's never going to get you there. Yeah. Or you're going to have to pull over three times and fix on the, on the yeah. way. So I don't understand. It's a, it's uh, a, unless it's a masochism for the experience, but the car, it actually gets there. It just beats you up on the way. Lotus Elise. If I were 20, I wish I had had the money to have an Elise as my daily when I was 20. That would be fun. Yeah. It's uh, it's an experience. But the fact of like getting crashed into stuff in the... You, one with a pre, pre-cracked pre clamshell. Oh, yeah. Because get one with, you know, that's that's not original. Don't get by a collector grade Elise because you're going to crack the clam when somebody opens a door into you. and then Yeah, and then it's a... Yep. $10,000 plus. What car are you currently lusting after that you could actually afford if you tried? Uh, I ha always have a list of those things going. Could that be a whole episode? The 71,652 cars that Derek is lusting after. Yeah. I mean, but the, the short list, this is weird. I, okay. 6.9. I've always wanted a 6.9. Still haven't owned one yet. Mm -hmm. I really want a Mercedes 450 SEL 6.9. Uh, Lancia Fulvia 1.3 Series 1 Coupe. Uh, the 1963 and a half Ford Galaxy Fastback with a big block <laughs> has to be at least 390 cubic inches, ideally 406 or 427. Uh, three-door Range Rover Classic V8 manual. Those, cool. That's my list. <laughs> and none of those are like, the th except for the Fulvia, so are like bizarre. really wildly yeah. entertaining cars. But I already have wildly entertaining yeah. cars. I've got a 911 and I've got the GTI. The 6.9 is wildly entertaining in the fact that it's so soft. Uh, I am not lusting after anything. I'm done. I have too many cars. You always say that. Yeah, and then I buy. I've also else. been on a little Citroen kick. I mean, if I could have a DS, I would definitely. And your SM has not arrived yet. CX. It has not CX, arrived sorry. yet. Yeah. Okay. This one's on you. Disagree on do cars. We disagree on regarding sound. Uh, yeah, flat plane V8s. Interesting. So it seems like I lean towards engine notes that are pretty and musical, while Hyphen seems to prefer prefer ones that are gruff and angry. 
But that having been said, I really like inline sixes. I think my favorite car noises come out of inline sixes. Except for S54. Yes. I just spent a couple of days with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the US car S54s mm-hmm. sound like garbage. But with the right intake and apparently different uh, exhaust manifolds, they sound decent. I think we're fully aligned. I mean, that 24 valve V6 Busso that we drove, the 164, I mean, we were both mouth agape. Couldn't yeah. fucking believe. Uh, I think the only one we really disagree with uh, is flat plane V8s. Yeah. Um, and I, I understand why you don't like flat plane V8s because they don't make music except out the exhaust if you have equal length runners and blah, 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 blah. Um, but I it think always we, sounds like a four cylinder to me. Yeah. But I think we agree that the 308 GT4s, flat because plane Because you get is, mechanical noises and Weber induction noise. I mean, I think if I had to choose my favorite part of car noises, it's probably induction noise. Yeah. Mine too. Induction and mechanical. Exhaust is the sort of after effect. Oh, I like it. I like exhaust after induction and mechanical noises. Depends what the mm. nature of the mechanical noise. Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I think we we agree on most of it. I don't. I also don't love a three fifty five exhaust uh, engine note. But we are more aligned than disaligned. Then, yeah. Okay. Jason, would you ever make your spreadsheet public? Wants to read all your notes about miscellaneous automobiles. No, be and no, and it's not for any reason other than there's just a lot of inside, sort of inside baseball. It's references to stuff that just as a reminder that just wouldn't make sense. There's a huge amount of profanity in there. Um, which obviously isn't, doesn't stop us from talking here, but it's uh, it's just not the amount of work that it would take me to go look at three thousand some cars and and filter out, make it make it readable and scrutable is not worth it. So, yes, but, but yeah, I'd, would you I'd accept readable. specific requests? <laughs> Sounds absolutely. like yeah, absolutely. I should make a Patreon and say for give me one cent and I will tell you what I thought about your car when I drove it unfiltered, uh, you know, but. Yeah. Uh, not 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 right now are we ever going to do the pH episode yes one two three oh yeah sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh is there v6 you actually enjoy not including the buso um yes toyota's v6 i think is lovely um the, the yeah, one in the avora gt e- even in the, some of the toyota stuff it, it's, yeah. it's it's a it's a short stroke big bore high revving it's a nice v6 mm-hmm. um i was very impressed by it when i drove one in a in avora yeah they're they're quite good i mean V6s are not necessarily terrible, but they're compromised. You always say they are, though. I'm trying to think there's other... I have yet to try... V6. I've never driven a Dino. Like in uh, the Stratos. That was a really... uh, The the clips I've heard of that thing uh, from your iPhone and things I've seen on YouTube, whatever, that thing sounds unbelievable. I I can't wait to drive a Dino V6. Um, There's got to be another one somewhere, maybe. Probably not. Okay. VR. VR6 is a straight six. Okay. All right. Has one head. Okay. <laughs> Which cars generally love that you do not like? Do I'm, not like? Yeah, I mean, there's many. We talked about the two. S2K. Yeah. NSX. Um, there Jerry, are I'm assuming them. anything post-1990. <laughs> LOL. Uh, I mean, there's many cars. I, that, that's the point of this show. Yeah. Carmudgeons. Yeah, we hate stuff everything. We dislike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But here's the other one. Here's the flip the flip around. What cars generally hated do you love? That's a whole episode, I think. Sure, I think. But he said, Jason, I'm assuming you're 308 GT4, and they're not generally hated. They were, yeah. they were hated because of the way they looked, without question. Yes. But every review I read on that car back in the day, it was they were stunned by the driving experience. And I think the way it looked colored it. So, yeah. Um, Okay. I mean, yeah, there's so many. This is, I think we should probably do a deeper dive on this. All right, I'll turn it green <laughs> and then we can do an episode. We can mark this to like the episode, do an episode that we never can talk. Okay, this one's aimed at you. Uh, Jason won't shut the fuck up about all the cars he has. Oh, wow. Would you tell us what is in my in our, in your current garage? Uh, I sold the GT3. Uh, so I have... The Miura, the 964, the GTI. I have the yeah Ducati Panigale V4S. Uh, what else do I have? The CX. We've talked about the CX quite a bit. Uh, Which you don't actually have. I do not yet. have physical yeah. possession of yet. I have an R129 SL500 Miata track car. Half. Mm-hmm. Half a Miata track car. NA with a 1.8. That's it. I don't think I have anything else. I'm uh, trying to. Oh yeah, I have to have a 2.316. That's yep. in Switzerland. 
Uh, okay. Next up, uh, Nick D. A long-time listener, first-time emailer. Um, what car manufacturer automotive conglomerate most embodies the essence of Game of Thrones, i.e. decades of internal ruthless backstabbing, power plays, and or crushing competitors and rivals with maybe a dash of incest? I bet they all do. Oh, for sure. However, I mean, like the story of like British Leyland and the British motor industry generally in that era. I don't know anything about that, but I will tell you, this has got to be a whole episode because of the Piesch, Porsche, Pichas Lida family that is all incestuously owned and operated the entire German auto industry uh, for years. So, yeah. With possible exception of Mercedes. Yeah, but Piesch did the five-cylinder for Mercedes on... But he never, like, worked He there. never worked there. It was, like, an independent project. Yeah. yeah. And then not much with BMW either, right? Piches Rita. Mm. And the Kwan family has, which is the family that owns BMW, has some ties with somebody else, if I remember The correctly. Nazis? <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> next question what production car origin story would you would you like to see uh being be being given uh, being given the ford versus right. ferrari treatment yep um, made into a feature film mm -hmm. multi-episode miniseries i mean i think the vw porsche thing for absolutely sure i mean it, given it would the be enormous people, it would be like a series it would be, have to be a netflix season thing yeah i mean, I mean given the actually, amount of people who are asking for the p episode you're this is i mean there's the proof right there yeah how did volkswagen come to be and become to be the biggest conglomerate of insanity in the mm -hmm. automotive industry i think also there's a couple of other stories that are just get sort of lost and swept I mean, maybe no one will care but like the whole bentley right. thing in the beginning uh and how he floated around and ended up at laganda and all that stuff is, is pretty neat and the relationship between rolls royce and bentley because we tend to think of them as being having been in bed but rolls royce ended up owning bentley through a sealed bid process when bentley declared bankruptcy and so, like, that's the ultimate insult is to be, like, a guy who's got your own car company and then you can't manage it and go to business and out of business. And the person who ends up buying it does it clandestinely through a sealed bid is your your biggest competitor. Is that as scandalous as how Porsche, uh, how Volkswagen wound up owning Bentley and BMW wound up owning Rolls-Royce when they were purchased together? and As a pair. I don't even remember. From, uh, they both came from... Well, Vickers Group was the thing that right. where they were co-owned. And then in 1998, they both went to BMW and then Audi ended up buying Bentley off of. Yeah, but BMW th didn't get what it thought it was buying. This was the undoing of Peaches Leader, wasn't it? Oh, That he bought news to Bentley Rolls Royce, but didn't get, the, he got the name, but that was it and couldn't do anything with the name. Of Bentley? Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. So they bought, they bought it and didn't get what they thought. And Volkswagen wound up with Bentley. I did not uh, yeah, that. Uh, that, that's another, that's a great episode. You want to talk about backstabbing Game of Thrones shit, but that's part of the VW group thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. This one's you, right? Uh, short geared driver focused experience cars. Comment on the classic mini. Uh, hilarious. Wildly entertaining. Strongly recommend. That's really interesting. The only classic mini I've spent any time with was a. Oh, um, the one with the Honda K-Swap. Holy, no, not even a K-Swap, a B18C5. So Integra Type R motor punched out to 2.1 liters with insane cams in it. And I think it put 230 horsepower to the wheels or 240 to the wheels. What was left of them? Uh, holy shit. The scariest car I've ever driven. Uh, so I can't comment on this. But that was hilarious. In it, in yeah, a, but imagine that with a you know 100 horsepower. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be a riot. They're, Terrible driving position. Terrible. Yes. Yeah, I mean, they took packaging to an extreme mm. in that car. With yeah. some compromises that I don't feel comfortable do. driving it because it, it, you're just it's the bus steering wheel the pedals are actually behind you so you have to do like Romanian contortionist leg thing it's very weird uh, but fine. <laughs> any other cheap classics that deliver an experience that doesn't reflect the price I mean I think Fulvia's are like this I, re, I, I mean those cars to me are undervalued especially compared to what GTVs are doing uh, any old car is going to be an experience even if it's like a sort of upright sedan car but if you're talking about like canyon carving a lot like peugeot 205 so those have gotten expensive probably the replace the 306 is mark, like that mark like one mark two hatches. gti's yeah. old hot hatches probably like 70s and 80s hot hatches mm -hmm. uh, maybe i've never driven a fiat 128 maybe that could be somebody yesterday was saying oh i can't believe a mark 2 gti 16 valve just sold for 44k somewhere whatever ball and i think that's underpriced given the experience that you can get from early mark one and mark two volkswagen gti's uh they should be far more than the pennies that they are now uh james robson this is actually kind of a repeat of a question we just answered what would you like to see from future electric sports cars to make them desirable driver's cars aside from accelerates fast uh there's kind of not much you can do i mean yeah it's like overpowered mm -hmm. light 
kind of softly sprung, so there's a lot of body motion. But you're not going to get it. You're, you you can't do the things you can do in a lightweight car with heavy. So with the current standard technology, you're not going to have great talkative steering in a heavy uh, electric car. Tesla for, for, uh, Roadster, maybe not with things. First, first gen. First gen, yeah. Best place to find old cars for sale, Craigslist, no E30s. Yeah, welcome. Um, Facebook Marketplace seems to be more of a thing ever since they started charging $5 to put stuff on Craigslist. There's less good stuff on Craigslist. So, I mean, Facebook Marketplace. Instagram, actually, oftentimes you find someone who has a car you really like, just <coughs> don't harass them, but uh, indicate you're interested. And I've definitely had cars come my way that, through that path. Uh, and just following the right people at my C36, I found because somebody I knew bought it and it was like a one owner, 33,000 mile car in a weird color. And like, so found it through Instagram. Um, Go to car, car meets. Car meets. Yeah. Cars and coffee. If you coffees. see something you like yeah. that you love, just talk to the person, chat them up and be like, here's, you know. You never know. It could be somebody like, you know, who I wants just to sell about it. selling this or yeah. I, like I've got my eye on the next thing or like it's cool, but it's not for me or I've done everything I want to do with it. So yeah, car meets. Okay. Uh, Reggie Mayfall, dear Jens, uh, this guy's, uh, uh, from Pittsburgh. So he, he knows how to get my attention. I'm writing this email to ask how often you reach the limits of your tires. How often uh, do you often every time I drive, there's At a squeal. One point. Yeah. There will be a, a max lat corner or a little bit of a burnout. Uh, every time I drive it. So, I mean, he's, I know you like Michelin's, but crappy all season seems to hold up quite well going 70 in a 30 zone. Okay. I do not recommend doing 70 in a 30 zone. A 30 zone automatically implies that there are pedestrians and things that you could easily kill. Um, so despite the fact that I look like I drive like an uh, idiot, it is usually actually a closed not course. in a pedestrian um, yeah. environment. I mean, uh, I like grip, but um, my brakes give up before my tires do. And that tells me that you are probably overusing your brakes. Or hauling ass in a straight line and not going through corners fast enough, right? Just don't break. Yeah. If you don't break before you go into a corner, you'll reach the limit of your tires. Well, if he's got sl- crappy all seasons on, he's going to he's not going to break into a tree. So let's uh, let's not hurt him. Yes, but uh, but the indication that brakes skipping up before tires is means that you're probably slowing down too much for corners. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, is this one me? Dan Eisenstadt. Best daily for learning a manual transmission. I would say it's the cheapest manual transmission car you can find because you might use it up. Although the way that I teach people to drive manuals is actually seems to be quite sympathetic. Like I've never had moments when I was teaching someone how to drive a manual where I was like, ooh. I've like, never smelled clutch from anyone I've ever taught. Yeah. Um, I think I think that actually the, the answer to this is anything pre-drive-by-wire and if you can get a clutch cable you'll be that much better off but that's tough to find these days and you don't want something with a really heavy non-progressive clutch i very honestly i kind of think that one if you can drive something difficult then you can drive anything all the modern cars easy and that's the reason why i don't want to drive by wire because there's so many things that are happening in the background that you don't realize and it's trying to help you out i was in the car with with a friend this past weekend he was driving the cabbie and it was on off on off and on that car i go through front motor mounts quickly because i don't know why um but you can actually could it be feel, all of the modifications it could be the modifications it could be the the clutch dump burnouts <laughs> and the tremendous amount of grip that i have from r1 r tires on it whatever it is but you who can, can actually say? you who can say but every time he was on and off the gas you can actually feel the front mount hitting its limit stops boom 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 and i finally said something and i'm like i now i know you only drive cars modern cars with drive with with by wire throttles because that smooths out so when you pull your throttle foot off the throttle they smooth that out and when you mat it back again it's a ramp up so if you drive something that's not by wire you're controlling the actual throttle directly with no computer i have never noticed that or you know you go to people that get in in modern cars cars in there as the clutch is coming up it blips the throttle itself and goes from 800 to 1200 and anti-stall is active no no, no, that's not the right way to do it. Go buy a shit box that with a clutch kit is $110. So if you do burn it out, um, you're fine. And then learn the mechanics of how a transmission works and how a clutch works. Because once you understand what's happening, it's the easiest thing in the world. Um, but you're not going to, ne- you'll never know what's happening if the computer is doing it all in the background for you. Mm-hmm. Um Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Lots of questions from Richard Pazella. Um, okay, <clears throat> he has a, a 2020 Julia, um, 
And since a bunch of questions that revolve around that Alfa Romeo Giulia, he needs something with an automatic for medical reasons. Um, his first question is, is it worth to get something a GR, like a GR86 with an auto? Yeah. Yeah, if you have a, like, I mean, some sports car is better than no sports car. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, so he's talking about Alfa Giulia on a couple occasions and he's gotten, he's got a two liter. And the question basically is that why doesn't the two liter, why isn't the two liter appreciated? Why is Alfa Romeo generally not? It's just an obscure mark that... I mean, a lot of reasons why these cars get sold, I think, are to, to the unwashed masses who are like, I want a premium brand. And Alfa Romeo to the unwashed masses doesn't have that appeal, right? If you're, you're looking at who buys and leases 320Is, 328s, and C300s, they're like, ah, I drive a Mercedes. And you're mm-hmm. like, you know, you could have a much better Volkswagen you, for less money. You know what those people are? Those are the people who are always like, I parked my Mercedes over there. It's There's something strange about American Mercedes drivers where they, once you have a Mercedes, you no longer call it your car, you call it your Mercedes. Have you noticed yes. that? Uh, so I parked my Mercedes and walked to the, hey, excuse me. You parked your front wheel drive shit box. <laughs> your A class. Right. Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, CLA. But yeah, the people are buying that car, especially at the entry level, is what you're talking about, right? The really bottom of the, the Mercedes range in the BMW for they're buying into prestige because they could have a better price, a better, better car, car at that same price. For the same price, but it wouldn't have the same badge. Right. I would have a Julia over, first of all, I think I would, when you, once you consider price in, I'd, I would buy a Julia 2 liter TI over a Quadrifoglio. And I think the reason the Quadrifoglio get all the attention is remember who works at car magazines. These are guys who get free cars from, that's that's part of a different episode that we're going to do. But a lot of journalists don't own cars themselves. And they're they're on a constantly rotating schedule of driving press cars, which is part of our job. But they don't own cars on the, on the other side. So when you start to factor in what brakes cost for a Julia QV and what tires cost for a QV and what gas costs and insurance costs and maintenance and all the rest of this stuff is you factor in the four cylinders probably enough. Um, and that four cylinder is charming. It's not high revving. It only rests at like five grand. Um, but it reminds me of the E46 in that it's this upright sort of driving position and it's a willing participant. You're never fighting with it. Please move. By the time you're you're starting to think about passing someone, it's already downshifted. It's like, come on, let's go, let's go, come on, let's. Ha-. It's that sort of friend that's goading you to do certain terrible mm-hmm. things. I love it. I love that, Julia Julia. But the reason I think that the the answer to the question is why doesn't get any love is because the people, a lot of people in this part of the market, uh, are not enthusiasts. Mm-hmm. Right. But and his point is why the 330i and uh, 330i and A4 tend to get a lot of coverage in journalism. They sell um, more of them. Yeah. And they're p- pandering to the audience. The other thing is Alfa Romeo's uh, pro- p- press, the, the unseen backside of this is their press department doesn't exist. I mean, I don't know. BMW's press department is big and they're communicating and they call me and they actively you know, say, hey, we have this coming out, or would you like to come here and drive this new thing? Um, and for a long time, Alphas literally wasn't present. And when I say that, I mean, I once landed in Italy and sat at the airport with a bunch of other journalists. We had no contact phone number. They sent us tickets and they forgot to send someone to the airport to pick us up. And then somebody shows up with a cigarette in his hand and he's like, ah, ciao. Get, we get in some van and they drop us off at a hotel in an industrial park and left us for dead. There was no dinner. We had to, we, fine, we fended for ourselves, but we literally didn't even know where we were. You take your phone out and say, oh, we're in the town of such and such, and there's a pizza place two blocks away. That's the difference PR makes. If they're not, if they're not making the cars accessible to us and not you know, bringing us to the factory and towing stuff, we can't talk about it. So I think that's another part of the reason. Um, <clears throat> and uh, last is question. Is there a prospect for, even, for reasonably priced EV sedans? Absolutely, it's coming. EVs are right now at the, remember, it's very easy to say, these things are never going to work and whatever. It, they're at the infancy. This is the very beginning of EVs. They We've will. already seen progress in that sense. I mean, Tesla Model S, when it came out, was like nominally started at $60,000 and, you know, are easy to make six-figure cars. And now we're in an era where, yes, indeed, the Model 3 exists and it costs appreciably less than a mm-hmm. Model S, still not a cheap car, but, you know, it's progressing. And they're now like down to about... Yeah, and they're you know the the Tesla Model Three is down to about the price of a an average new car, um, and I think for a fifty thousand dollar Model Three, a forty five thousand dollar Model Three, is a perfectly reasonable competitor to a forty five thousand dollar anything else. Um, so we're getting there. Mm-hmm. Well, it'll it'll keep trickling down. This is a nine sixty four question. Have I ever considered this swap the current setup to equal length headers? Absolutely. I'm just cheap. 
but yeah, that's the dream would be to put a, a proper dual out setup from like a 993 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, this is a question for 964 owners because 964 has an exhaust that routes back around the front of the engine and it's yes. deeply unequal length in the same way that an STI is. Yep. But it doesn't get that thrum. So it just, inst- where most 911s and we think of like GT3s now scream at these yep. high octaves, 964 is a sort of mellow. Yeah. And that's and the Carrera 3.2 has the same design uh, in the US market, actually Europe too, and the SC. Anything post SS uh, post the two out system, but yeah, all of those cars react well to having a, a proper dual out system, and it's absolutely something to consider doing. It's I'm just cheap. Uh, Plus, you get rid of the cat. Yes, legal. Yeah, I mean emissions, safety emissions. Safety first. Uh, oh, yes, next question. <laughs> Distraction. Rico, uh, can a GR86 or any modern attainable car provide it as satisfying a driving experience as a classic lightweight sports car like a Porsche 964, 240Z, or Alpha 105? 964 is 3,000 pounds. It's not that light. Uh, okay. But yes, I think the answer to this question is probably not. It depends what you enjoy and what you find satisfying. But there is a, a level of texture and in- involvement and engagement just as relates to, for example, pulling the clutch out like Jason described a few moments ago. Uh, there, There is nothing about it. Modern cars cannot do that. And so I think, can they provide? No. I mean, it depends what you value. Mm. If you don't give a shit about the what? Mm, here's the problem he said gr86 that thing is a fucking unmitigated riot it's so good it's not it doesn't have the texture you're talking about at all get an alpha 105 holy shit the engine noise is amazing steering's vibrations but your texture through the gear change it's magnificent you're not going to get the same kind of experience but his question was as satisfying an experience okay and i would say because that car is so well sorted suspension wise and the shift are so good the clutch is good and the fucking handling is so unbelievable that i will happily slide a gr86 around a school zone not literally but you're having so much fun at normal speeds that it can provide as satisfying a driving experience as your daily driver I would still have an Alpha 105 or Z or something else older for true experience. What also depends, as I said at the beginning, what do you find satisfying? Do you find it satisfying to hoon a car around at 10 tenths? Because if that's the case, then the 105 is probably not the answer because it starts to get a little like sketchy at that point and you're worried about braking or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so it really depends. The answer is it depends. Do you, would you rather have just something that's a wonderful dynamic experience without any excuses that in a way that modern cars are really good at, or do you want all that sort of texture and excitement of vintage cars? Right. With the compromise of it's probably going to break and you know, it's not as safe and yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, he, he said the wrong word that, uh, GR86 is so good. Etienne, Etienne Manuel Renault. Uh, my question is about Frank, flat plane, flat plane, Um, okay we should okay so the question is do you find flat plane crankshafts in other engine formats this is the primary so the the first question is sort of are there other manufacturers other than ferrari who use a flat plane v8 and yes mclaren currently yes corvette z06 corvette z06 the uh, gt350 um now dead but yes that did in the past also the lotus esprit v8 was Mm -hmm. a uh, flat plane and Mm -hmm. the tvr cerbera as well flat plane 4.2 okay um but do you find flat plane crankshafts in other formats v6 v10 v12 or even volkswagen groups v12 and w16 so (coughs) the there's a lot of misinformation about what makes a flat plane crankshaft when we talk about flat plane versus cross plane crankshafts we are only talking about 90 degree v8s because there are two your choice of firing order for a 90 degree v8 is either a flat pl- uh, is either having each engine run one four three one three four two one three four two each side of the engine as a traditional four cylinder would, or having basically two V fours joined at the crank. Right, um, the cross plane crankshaft, and this is just this is only cross plane and flat plane only describe how they look, uh, but a cross plane crankshaft you need a ninety degree uh, included angle for that. A, well, a cross plane crankshaft has throws if you're looking down yes. the length of it at 360. So at top, bottom, left, and right. So it has throws at every 90 degree interval, um, two at a, each one. And that results in a firing order of basically two V4s, which are evenly balanced, effectively evenly balanced. If you have a flat plane crankshaft, if you're looking down that same crank, 
you could get rid of the two on the side and you'd only have throws that are up and down. And so when you put the crank down on the ground, it would just lie down. Then it's visually a flat plane crankshaft. What that results in is each bank of four cylinders runs as a four cylinder would and you have the vibration of a four cylinder times two. Um, so you, it only applies to V8s, right? There's a compromise built in, so it's a ton of vibration. Um, and for that reason, they've typically been limited in displacement size because the, the, the more piston you have and the, the, more, the further it's moving- For flat planes. For flat planes, sorry. Yes. Um, you're just gonna have a limit before it blows itself apart, i.e. the Ford Voodoo motor having problems. Um, but yeah, V6s don't have flat plane crankshafts. You'd have a terribly uneven firing order. Um, I guess, could you for a 90 degree V6? I don't even know. But it's when we talk about that, it's only for 90 degree V8s. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what would be your advice on going sideways with an open diff rear wheel drive car? What's the trick? What's the uh, trick? Chassis. You have to induce the slide with the chassis, which means you can either trail break it in, Scandi flick it in, or one way or another, get the car sideways off Upset. of power, yes. and then you can start to apply power. And even with an open diff, once you're sliding the back of the car with an open diff, you can usually get both wheels on fire and keep a drift going. Not that I've ever done that. Mm -hmm. um, Jason Grady asks, how much does suspension layout impact the driving experience? Does with double wishbone suspension at all four corners dramatically improve the drive over struts all around? I think that the specifics of the layout are less important than the overall design and tuning of the setup. I like would. We've driven, for example, cars with beam axles where you're like, this is a very enjoyable car to drive and it has a beam axle. Mm -hmm. And you go drive cars with like pretty sophisticated stuff where you're just like, it's not functioning. Like there's, I think a lot of it has to do with how the, it's executed. Uh, I think you're totally right. I think there are people who have said to me, I can't handle a strut up front. I can, you know, strut turn in is terrible. I can't feel the difference. I mean, you, uh, in some cars, you can definitely feel bad tuning, uh, but it can almost always be tuned out. You know, uh, you drive a 911 GT3 and and tell me you have a problem with the way that car turns in. I don't. I don't. You're get talking it. about the 991. Well, and no, a previous, previous. Yeah, yeah. Any any or any 911 earlier. earlier yeah. I don't have an issue with the way that car turns in. And somebody could say, yeah, struck cars have camber change through the channel. I, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't get it. The difference is when you start to get really bumpy stuff the better suspension designs will lose grip less. So for example, you get a 190, 190E Mercedes with a five link rear suspension versus an E30. The bumps bumps will really upset this E30 semi-trailing arm rear suspension, but doesn't the Mercedes just doesn't give a shit. Part of that is tuning, but a lot of it is geometry. We're at a point now where you can compensate so much for geometry that I dare you to drive a Jetta base and a Jetta GLI back to back, right? One has a torsion beam and the other one has even better. Drive a Mazda 3 with a torsion beam. This is an assy, fun car that handles really well and it loses grip at the rear more easily, which makes it more assy. So you can tell that difference, but I'm sorry. I don't think the layperson can. And I think you have to drive them back to back. And tuning and it depends trumps, more on how it was tuned. Yeah, and tuning trumps design. Yeah. Um, Porsche used to be known for its notably superior brake braking. Um, is that still the case? Yeah. yeah. Porsche has always had superb brakes. And it's for two reasons. Number one, we're talking 911 have weight distribution that really helps under braking uh, because it moves a lot of the weight to the rear. So when that's transferred to the front under braking, there's far less up there. Um, and also Porsche uses enormous brakes that are sized properly for the car and are, uh, are cooled properly with air. And all of this comes from motorsport. Yeah. They know a lot about brakes because they know a lot about breaking brakes. Yep. Um, this is an interesting question. The Probably. green one, yes, yep. which you see is, is an indication that we quite enjoyed it. Manufacturers' native territory affects the way they instill character in their vehicles. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. You, could, you could actually, I think, probably write a book about this, honestly. Yeah, each car being a reflection of where it came from. Yes, it is, a, it is a what we would call in school. It was a physical embodiment of culture mm -hmm. of that place. Yeah, basically. that's a great. We'll do a whole episode on that. I think that's a great. Thank you, we Jason, should. Jason R. Grady. Uh, anonymous. Anonymous. Um, while you've said that the BMW Z3 and Z4 do not have enough suspension travel and chassis balance to compete with Boxster Cayman, that's not really, that's not all variants, but do you think that the M variants add enough performance and experience improvements to pick them over the Porsche products? No. 
I was going to do one, two, three again. But oh, sorry. Need, yeah. I can't even wait. No contest. Just different leagues. It's architecture, right? It's not like putting stiffer springs on your car, on your regular ass car doesn't make it a sports car. It just makes it ride harder. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Um, can you think of cars for which you're not fans of the regular version, but a higher performance trim added enough theater to pick the worst platform? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like every hot hatch, for example. I mean, the base cars are often fine, but but yeah, my, my yeah. the thing that comes to mind is a W two hundred four Mercedes C class. I'm not recommending a C three fifty to anyone. It was fine. It's good, um, but I would always have chosen at the time an E ninety BMW over it. Now, when you go to a C sixty three AMG, yeah, I mean, it just especially because that is such an outlier motor, yeah. Uh, it, nowadays, you know, big V8s in that pla- when it was the G- E90 generation, when there were a couple of V8 options functionally available for you, like yeah, then maybe that doesn't isn't a thing anymore. Yeah. But in more recent times, until the most recently announced one came out, you're like, where else can you get a V8 in a car that size? Right. Yeah. Regular 202 Mercedes uh, C class is a really good example because like a regular 202 C280, I don't think I'd really recommend. It's, it's not fine. a fine. It's well engineered, but and, it's not an E36 to drive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But however, C43, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, Cause okay. it, a lot of it is, is the engine really transforms yep. the car. Uh, can a car have so much grip? It is dangerous. Yes. We have talked about, for example, someone who put too much grippy tires on their uh, 2.3 Cosworth and f- rolled it on the track Yeah, or your cabriolet at times cabriolet. when you're driving around on uh, t- one, one and, and a half, half wheels, wheels <laughs> two, two yeah. wheels yeah. at a time. You can have, is the correct level of grip whatever allows you to just barely break traction at the limit? Well, by what, by, by definition. Def- those are the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Breaking you, traction at the limit is running out of grip. The correct level of grip is usually somewhere around what the factory programmed in. And when you know you've exceeded what you should be doing is when you're at the, when you're not yet at the handling limit of the car, but the car is, uh, but the outside of suspension is firmly in the bump stops, having leaned all the way over, and every little bump comes across like you're getting hit with a baseball bat. Yes, There's and then the car indication. starts skipping across the surface yes. yeah. because there's no suspension travel anymore. Right. Uh, so yes, that's a dangerous state to, to be in. One hundred percent. Right. Matt Emery says, uh, "My question is, what would you have in your garage as the perfect special GT car?" Uh, he listed it. Aston V12 v- S Vantage seven speed manual is yeah. still the one for you. Still yeah. the one. Nothing, nothing comes closer. No, well, don't you want to like sort of almost call that a sports car? No, it's too good of a, it's a GT car with a sports car body and a sports car set of gears. I mean, it's, that's fucking God. So you want the, the GT. That's the most sports car. Yeah. But I mean, is it really a sports car? You know, 30, 800 pound compact two door with a big trunk I, does it make you laugh oh god yeah that to me is very a sports car character the the special gt thing is it's not quite as laughy it's a car that there's a point at which driving it harder doesn't make it more fun i think that's one of the key characteristics that differentiates a sports car from a gt there's a point i think you could which, say that about the aston I mean, it's so, not a car that I would really haul ass on a back road with. Drifted around a track at fourth gear drifts, yes, all day. But it's it's the that car is fun in normal driving in the way a sports car should be. But it's a perfectly relaxed, civilized Grand Tour with an amazing interior and a great stereo. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I love the the things that he lists here because they're all very different. They're super different, right? Like a CLK sixty three AMG Black Series is one of the best drives you'll ever have. And that thing is magnificent, ruined by the transmission. So I would not have it because it was a, a five-speed automatic without, down, it wouldn't blip the throttle on a downshift. Mm-hmm. And so it will throw the car sideways occasionally because you've requested a downshift. It denied it, but kept it in its memory. And as you slow down, then it slam shifts the downshift, <laughs> locks them up and no. Uh, R129 SL73. I mean, I've never driven one. I'm sure it's wonderful. But I that, mean, you know, it really depends where you lie on the spectrum. Of car enthusiasts, that is. <laughs> um, Glad you clarified that. Uh, this but, episode but, is sponsored by Autism Awareness. <laughs> uh, Paolo is allergic to that. He started sneezing when he heard Spectrum. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, these are such different cars. I mean, do you want a vintage, just like lots of... 330 GTC. 330 GTC to me is just... All I think about is Weber induction noise and like the valve train sounding really expensive. Just hearing that car idle, the valve train sounds expensive. You don't mm-hmm. get that experience in modern cars. What are the things, you know, that, that you seek? It, I, it, what this requires is a shrink. You need a shrink to be like, what do you care about? What's important to you? What are the values of, of a car experience mm-hmm. that most excite you? 
and then you can answer that question because there is these, each of these cars has really strong highlights that are very different from the strong highlights of the cars elsewhere in the list. Right. So his list starts with, in in this order, a Ferrari 330 GTC, which is a magnificent 1950, late 50s, early 60s cruiser. 66. Geneva is it that 66 late? Okay, is when that car sorry. came out. Sorry. I've driven one. It's unbelievably soft and cushy and manageable and the motor's sweet and everything's great. 512 TR. Torque. 512 Tesserosa, so T- Tesserosa, but 512 TR, the later one, uh, size of a house in width. One, it's like a seven series with a magnificent engine. Um, that's a nice Grand Tourer. Mm-hmm. But yep. yeah, that's great. Also, F12. <laughs> it's one of my that's, favorite two pedal Ferraris, if not yeah, my favorite two pedal Ferraris. But it's a two pedal. So, so is the Black Series. Yeah. And then, so then we have SL73 R129, Aston V12 Vantage, 993 Carrera 2S. That would be my last pick. Was it would be a nine nine three CT? I agree with that as well. To me, a nine eleven should not be doing GT duty. To well, me, a nine eleven should be like an RS product, and you're, you're really yeah. sports carring it. The, well, he has he has a nine nine seven two GT three RS, so he's got the. That's the that that's is the, the ultimate yeah. liquid cooled nine eleven, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, mm-hmm. is the nine nine seven GT three RS, and so you shouldn't use a nine eleven as a as a GT. You've already got the right nine eleven answer. Yeah, so that's why I would. I would get rid of anything. I would get rid of a black series and whatever. I would just go straight for the V12 Vantage. Um, and it, if it were me, I mean, that's just, that car does everything. I mean, unfortunately, 330 GTCs are not $250,000. They're like $600,000. Yeah. Um, anyway. And I'd want a GTS. Anyway, drop oh, Okay, those are not $600,000. Yeah, those are like $2 million. I know, but this is not me. This is not my money we're spending. 512 TRs aren't 250K. Are, are they? Yeah, they are. Really? Yeah. Barely. Jesus. Yeah. Okay, next up. $10,000 to spend. What car or SUV would you buy as an investment? My God. That would be worth twice as much in just a few short years. No, just no. don't. You just buy a car because you like it. You know, well, and I'm not just saying this to be contrary or say that it's dumb to invest in cars. I actually think that this is somewhat relevant because if you like the car, then chances are someone else likes it and then there will be demand for that car and then its value could go up. I'm not going to say that it will go up, but for example, like... I don't know, choose thing that has done this. Porsche 944 turbos used to be $8,500 or E36 M3s are, have mm-hmm. gone up by, you know, at least 50% or whatever the car is. You know, E30 M3s used to be $10,000 or $15,000 and are now 60, 70, 100, depending on the condition. Uh, but all of these things are cars that people liked. It was their enthusiasm for the car and everybody else's shared enthusiasm that caused demand for that car to go up and the price to go up. So... When we say buy what you like, we're not just saying like, oh, it's dumb to invest in cars, but there is something, hopefully your taste is mainstream enough that other people will right. do the same thing and the market will move in lockstep with what you have chosen to do. Uh, you're, that's a perfectly rational point. My answer to this is when you, what are you buying as an investment? I would say invest in yourself, invest in a good time and then you can't lose, mm-hmm. right? If you're buying the car that you love, it's because you love it. If you lose money, we can't predict this stuff. If we could predict this stuff, we'd both be mil- like multimillionaires living in somewhere else, not in this shitty ass studio with that crap TV. And sorry I didn't mean to insult anyone, but seriously, I don't have a crystal ball. Despite the fact that I literally have a crystal ball, I don't know if you guys can it's see just this. Glass. No, it's actual crystal ball. Oh well, yeah. is it I on? Bl- look into it. See if you can tell me what. Tell him what ten thousand dollars SUV to buy. Eric Hewitt asks, why are so many car collections being sold? Do the owners of these collections still own other other better cars that aren't being sold? Will the seeming trend of car collections being sold continue? Yeah, they're being sold because they're dying. The I, are dying. My answer to this is probably less somber than that. Uh, it's just that these were always the collections were always being sold off, but now that they're publicly available on the internet and being marketed. Yeah, yeah, you just didn't know it because you wouldn't know it unless you were on the catalog distribution list for for me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, it w- it's always happening. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's an that's an easy one. Gabriel Song. Recommendations for warming up engines. AMG says go for it, like kind of beat on it right out of the box. Right, and so Gabriel's question was about if I buy something like a G or Corolla, I'm stuck with a tiny three cylinder for the first, for the first ten or twenty minutes of driving. Oh, because you're trying winter. to keep it out of boost while warming up. Right. And so this is a really good point. And there's a huge benefit to having an enormous displacement, very torquey engine uh, because yeah, you don't you can have drive to around at 1800 RPM everywhere. Yep. And a quarter throttle. Um, my warm up procedure is very simple. I get in the car and I go. 
Um, no more than 3000 ish RPM, no more than a quarter third throttle at the absolute most until it's until the oil temp reaches 80 C, um, 80 degrees Celsius. But that was my warm up procedure until I started to talk to a bunch of engineers. Porsche's official internal thing is once the gauge hits 40 C, go for it. GM, I asked their engineers, they're like, as soon as the needle budges, go oh, for coolant. it. Uh, oil. Oil. But then I'm like, what on your personal cars? And they're like, oh, in the winter, I just fucking floor it. I don't care. Um, so the, well, that's cause they have company cars. Well, that's part of it, <laughs> but also because modern cars are so much better at managing thermal, thermal expansion and contraction. Think about these hybrids that go from literally turned off when you're in like, you know, when they're cold and then they're in EV mode until you're mad it. And now all of a sudden <laughs> it's turned off dead stone cold to red line max output instantly. Mm-hmm. They're fine. They're fine. Prius, you don't see Prius smoking from this. So my, I've adjusted my warm up procedure, and it's now it really depends on the car. It's gradual now because there is actually no oiling benefit once the oil is warm. This is an interesting thing. Oil still lubricates. There's no lubricity benefit. You're you're talking about expansions and flow, right? And you do have a zinc issue. So the reason you on older cars with flat flat tappic camshafts um and valve train i have to say that with a michigan accent you do uh you do have a lubrication benefit once it reaches a certain temperature when you have uh, a scraping effect you yeah you want a sheer layer of zinc coating both and that doesn't happen until a certain temperature but the engineers that i spoke to none of them could tell me what oil temperature approximately that would happen where the scraping effect would actually raise the local temperature above the point to deposit the zinc to do the whole thing. They're like, yeah, just at once you're at 40 Celsius, just kind of start ramping it up. Don't worry too much about it. So yes, you should stay at a boost. I, I tend to not beat the shit out of the cars, but if you watch the modern cars that have variable red lines on a, you know, on a 70 degree day outside, you're talking 30 seconds before they're allowed full revs. So it's, it can't be, um, it can't be that bad. For modern cars. For modern cars. Um, if you lived in Norway, which car would you buy? Because, of course, it has to be electric. Is that? Yeah, almost everything is electric in Norway. Wow. And he says right there, it would have to be electric, of course, and ready for the snow. I mean, I don't know. I guess it's a Tesla. I'd probably buy a Tesla. I mean, I did buy an e-golf, but I don't know what I want to do with That's not four-wheel drive. Yeah, who needs four-wheel drive? Mm, okay. Fu- uh, yeah. Um... Best climate control buttons ever placed in a car. E30. What? Yeah. I think E30 is just so simple. You have a temperature gauge. Or E30 W201, that generation of stuff. W201 is perfect because you have a... It's eh. kind of cryptic. No, you have a temperature a, a temperature slider and then distribution. Yeah, but what does the little two rectangles mean? Like why did like you, you look at that and you're like... Two rectangles? There's a little button. There's a little setting on that, th- that knob, the right one. Oh, it's well, like, yeah, it's the center gauges. So, so you, you well, can exactly. choose. Well, exactly. So this right. is an indication this is not the right. Okay, that that's why E30 wins. That's why E30 wins because it has a picture of a passenger with up, down, or both. Um, and just sl- and they have sliders. It's got three sliders. But what for if you top- want something like sexy, right? Like something really remarkable. This is not remarkable. You're talking about like best from a usability standpoint as opposed to like, look yeah. at the temperature indicators in this, their uh, iconic design. Is there such a thing? I mean, the answer to the question is I have no idea. Yeah. That's yeah. why I was puzzled by this question. Okay. Uh, but Luis did ask something something that we achieved a possible episode which is yeah what brands will disappear in the new future it's interesting because there's a history history is littered with brands that have disappeared mm-hmm. and it's interesting to see how they have how that process has occurred and who is at stake this is like one of those shows where who's getting voted off the island this week or whatever mm-hmm. but I it's easy to see there's lots of indications of when that stuff's coming jaguar <clears throat> yeah, um definitely. uh we'll do that we'll answer that in an episode henrik benedict weber uh chasen have you ever lived in cologne or what is the reason that uh, you have german number plates with cologne on my e30 and 201 i worked in cologne uh for a while and it just happened that both my e30 and 201 were registered in cologne before i moved them to the u.s and therefore i kept their front plate on it for that reason um why do you guys seem to prefer the e bmw e9 x series over the f3 x series have you driven on oh i've driven several E90 and he owns something. and owns an F thirty two. E ninety is the least desirable. Well, okay, I don't think the E nineties certainly pre LCI E nineties were not pretty, um, but they drove like 
they were incredible. They drive, drive everything that a BMW should, and the F30 drives everything that a BMW shouldn't. shouldn't. Yeah. I mean, the steering alone. But this is interesting because this person has owned both and mm-hmm. does not have the same conclusion. Has not well, right the off the bat, he's saying the ZF 8-speed automatic transmission is way better than the 6-speed in the E90-something. Um, well, you're using the wrong transmission. That's right. To, yeah. So here's the thing. So uh, from driving experience, there's just absolutely no contest not even close e90 crucifies f30 from an interior material standpoint <laughs> e90 wasn't great but f30 is yeah, but f30 n- is like is they bad. have the, there's like gaps in the dashboard that you could drive that VW rubbery bus through that rubbery material yeah, on the dash uh, um here's the thing about the f30 the front end was so weak the engineer, the, the structure of the front end was so weak on the F30 that M, which is a division owned within BMW, refused to make an M3 out of it. What does that tell you about the rest of the car? I mean, maybe that's not applicable. That's not transferable to the rest of the car. But BMW had to go back and re-engineer the entire front structure of the car because M flat out said we can't make an M3 out of this pile of shit. There's your answer. That car was cost cut cost cut and then cost cut some more to the point where nothing is better than it was it may be a better driving luxury car but a three series is not a luxury car a three series is supposed to be an ultimate driving machine they said it not me um and there's just no contest between the two and time will show very clearly which one is the more reliable car over the over time so um greetings from cologne that's why he asked the question about that sorry to beat up on your f30 a little bit but it was the it will go down as the dark ages of BMW. If they survive. That was the previous episode. We're not going to talk about that next. (laughs) Okay. For someone with a budget under 80,000 for a fun car, non-daily, what do you suggest that's fun to drive and borderline on the edge of scary, yet reliable? This again refers, I think, back to the definition of what you find to be fun. You know, for me, that's an old car experience, but that may not be true for everybody a lot of people don't have the tolerance for or find it fun to do old car things <laughs> broken down on the side of the road waiting yeah, for a tow weird. truck yeah uh and so you know that's this is a very personal question i think it needs a little more additional information yeah i mean here's the one thing i would say if if you're looking for something that's not a daily go as far away from a daily driver as you can get get something that is genuinely compromised max experience max experience even if that means it's miserable to get in and out of if it's you know it it should be rough and uncomfortable because you don't want to duplicate you don't want to duplicate daily driver what your daily driver does right this is why i have had such a weird number like a weird mixture of cars is because i'm seeking a different experience from each car Mm -hmm. and that's why i'm always so puzzled by people who own you know eight cars but they're all the same mark Mm -hmm. it's like there's so many different cars out there that you could be experiencing why would you choose things that are all sort of slight variations on the other cars that you already own it was really interesting so sretton from m539 was here as i said this past week and he drove a bunch of my cars over the weekend um and the he after five seconds in the beat i mean the the honda beat just blew his mind completely and he's like i need to broaden my horizons right off the bat it was great it was great to hear that but what he realized was that he said every one of your cars has a completely different experience and they're all charming in a very different way and it was a really good observation he drove you know e30 both of my e30 so beatrice the shitbox and then and then the wagon and then the cabbie and the beat and one other one i don't remember what it was it was just but they're all so different from each other and that is that's it go find an experience that's vastly different from your daily yeah hey man why it be have you either of you ever driven the waterford hills road racing track outside of clarkston michigan rumor has it sterling moss drove there in 1959 and called it one of his favorite courses ever um okay so the interesting thing the most interesting thing about waterford hills is it's in a neighborhood and do you there are school buses sometimes there, no not there but there are i'm sure there have been dogs from the neighborhood so there's a sort of off camper drop if i remember correctly so obviously yes i've been there uh and there's a little bit of a drop on an off camper turn onto the back straight um, which is tiny it's a very very small road course and the runoff is a house i mean it's you're, a fence there's a fence and there is you know there's a berman offense but it is literally someone's backyard right on the opposite side of that um it's a fun track because it's so small but if you're looking for a thrill in michigan go to the other side of michigan and go to Grattan raceway because Grattan is the stupidest track i've ever been on and therefore the most fun because the i will one day we'll do an episode on great tracks um about the best part about Grattan is there's a jump 
and while you're in the air or nearly airborne in most cars um you're passing pit out <laughs> so if the guy who is always there with like four cigarettes in his mouth and a, and a beer isn't paying attention and, and flags you out there's going to be a car that's going to hit your roof because they're it, amazing track but waterford hills yes fine okay nick zang i am if i'm to buy three new cars and then never touch a sports car again what should it be oh they're new cars mm -hmm. it's got to buy three new cars right so this is somebody who's like i've had an old gr86 an e46 zhp a 280z and currently have his quadrifoglio a new brz and an e46 track car and he's like i want to just five years from now i have to buy a minivan so i want three new cars that i have to buy right now and i'm never going to touch a sports car again what do i buy a really interesting question yeah it is yeah and i think we're gonna have exactly the same answer i mean yeah american v8 and some 911s i agree that yeah you should everyone should own a 911 at some point and drive it fast and I, my honest recommendation is if you want a, an unadulterated 911 experience i wouldn't buy a new one i think a 997 gt3 is kind of the ultimate for pure 911 age in the last decade or two sure two decades i guess uh and then yeah american v8 that could be like the shelby gt350 r yeah r you want the oh, the ultimate american v8 experience that's it i mean it's also a good chassis because yeah. otherwise you're getting like a gt500 with a live at rear end and like a supercharger yeah. and like that although the really... current gt500 is unbelievable yes. sorry i meant the last yeah. the, the yeah. live rear end one yeah but that's that's then a dual clutch yeah no i mean a, a mustang of some sort even though camaro stuff is really yes. good i mean that's a th that's a toss-up mm -hmm. yeah either one of those two cars not a hellcat not something no, like that. no 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 it has to be yeah the, um, the good chassis although like a charger wide body scat pack is a fucking like it's the best dumb sports sedan you've ever met it's so charming um so more but charming that, than an ss uh, than a Camaro SS or a Chevy SS? Uh, than the sedan. It doesn't come with a manual, or it would be, because it's just, it handles really well. It's just big, dumb fun. Where the SS was not dumb fun, it was more precise fun. Mm. Um, Slightly more clinical fun. Yeah, but this is not available new. So Okay, so um, those are the two things. Like we, and then like, he wants three cars. So um, it's a 911. So we've told him he's going to buy a Shelby GT350, basically, or 500, a 911 of some sort, because it's new. He's got to buy a GT500, even though I think they're all sold um and then third car it's gotta go italian italian if you're gonna if you're gonna you have one shot left before you buy a minivan and you have three cars to buy you're gonna have an american v8 a german 911 and you have to have something italian have what to. is the most italian car you can buy ferrari right now is it just go buy something with a ferrari if you're never but a new one if i told you you could never drive another sports car again as long as you live you have three shots left one of them's gonna be a ferrari isn't it yeah just to I say just, there's the, in terms of modern cars now i they don't really delight me that much but he says three new cars yeah if I it know, has I'm to be you. new then i i guess yeah it's or like, mclaren i mean i would no, totally no great steering no ferrari. i hate that engine yeah yeah no i mean so what ferrari is that you hey to wait, wait, wait. lamborghini huracan evo oh fucking yeah. unbelievable yeah okay yeah all right there you Fine. go never just go by yeah, but it's german but yeah okay um is this you or me i can't remember we've got another z3 z4 question oh so we've said jason mentioned a while back that he thought the z3 z4 were not good in part because it was designed from the not designed from the ground up as a sports car what about its driving characteristics make it underwhelming it's it is 800 pounds too heavy 500 pounds too heavy they are they are the problem with those cars is they have the proportions and the styling of a sports car. And I want that to light my hair on fire. I want that car to be all experience. And unfortunately, the experience in Z3s and Z4s is not as good as the sedan they're based on. I would rather have the sedan that they're based on. But um, what about its driving characteristics? This person is asking for specifics. They are... Not as rigid. They're not as rigid. They are... I don't like the driving position. I don't like sitting on the back axle. This is just That's a personal preference thing um they are heavy they're understeery they are not communicative so chassis balance is yeah. not good not not good communication they're okay but they're not it's get all you have to do if you if you don't understand why i'm hard on z3s is get in the a period correct porsche all right and compare so a 986 to a z3 or 987 to a first gen z4 there is just no contest in the lightness and agility and tactility and interaction you get between yes. the two cars with a porsche it is like an extension of yourself it feels so comfortable and everything every reaction that the car has is 
a sort of exactly what you're hoping for and you have this really enjoyable dialogue between you and the car and with z3s in my experience it always feels like you're kind of managing the car and you're like how do i i want to have this outcome what do i have what inputs do i have to make to this device Mm -hmm. in order to get the outcome i'm seeking and with a porsche it's you like kind of think it and then it kind of just like yeah I'll go one step further because I don't mind cars that you have to have a matrix to sort of translate input to output, right? 190s that way. They're non-linear. Yes, that's true. But ultimately that I can make a 201 do anything right. I want. And with the Z3 or like there's certain things where it's like, sorry, that's not available. Not, not available. Right. Yeah. That's off the menu for today. And fun is mostly off the menu for today. So oh, it also is off the menu is us because this is the last question in the Q&A. We have answered how many? 82 questions? 82 questions on Q&A. Um right. Great, some great stuff in there. Yes. I think our audience is a bunch of we intelligent have a sophisticated, people. enthusiastic car enthusiast, which big big shock because we're not delivering something that's entertaining to anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> is it even entertaining to the people who watch us? Uh, <coughs> they will say yes, but what do they uh, know? Okay, so I think we'll put the idea of a Q and A on hold for another little a little bit. But uh, we now have a whole bunch of episodes that we have to go do based on some really great great questions. Indeed, um, and one of those episodes should. And will be the P episode. Okay. Go read the book. Oh, fine. Um, okay. This has been episode 70 something of the Carmudgeon Show. Uh, join us next week. We're here every Monday ish. Um, approximately every appro- Monday. Approximately every Monday. Um, that is Derek Tam hyphen Scott, otherwise known as Derek Tam hyphen Scott. And this is Jason Camisa. All the way around. That. That. Is Jason oh, I'm, I'm speaking German. <laughs> yes. This this is Jason. Goodbye, everyone, from my side. <laughs> and you have to say, and also from my side. And also from my side. Here in sunny San Francisco, California, yes. where we talk to you about the car margin. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you've exposed your breasticles. <laughs> God, and the episode cut. is already over. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs>